uh, Carl Williams, you're, you're an, a lawyer and an activist, um, uh, an activist with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. Um, I know you've also been involved in the Civil Liberties Union as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, just quickly about um, your work and your activism as well. Um, so I'll say um, we do support uh, for, for folks who are doing Black Lives Matter work um, here in, in, in Boston and around the country. Um, I do work with the National Lawyers Guild. I, specifically, I would consider myself a movement lawyer, and that is supporting movements for social justice, um, uh, you know, fighting against white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, uh, capitalism, um, and related forms of oppression for our people. Okay, brilliant. Um, okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I wondered if you could first maybe just give us um, some background into the process. I mean, obviously, most people have a general right. So I missed one word you said, some background into? Uh, into the protest. Um, I mean, most people have an idea of, obviously, of, um, you know, what the initial catalyst was, but um, maybe, uh, maybe you could talk um, a little bit about the development of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, because obviously this isn't the first, um, you know, expression of that movement. For sure. I think the, the important thing to think about here is this is a thing that isn't just the past week. It isn't pa the past, you know, five years at the start of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. It's a, a history of 400 years, right? And Black people in this country in, the, in what has become the United States of America, have been fighting since the days when, you know, our, one of our great, 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 great grandmothers first arrived on the shores of this country and changed. Very, you know, sometimes those folks were here in Boston, actually, because Boston was a, um, a, a, a market for enslaved human beings, for enslaved black human beings. So since that day, people have been saying, how can I get these chains off? In actual fact, and, and virtual chains, right? So I think it's important to understand that that for always, for black people's existence in the United States, it has every single day since then till this very moment, um, until tomorrow, and until we're done doing it, um, it's been a struggle for liberation, right? And, and, and I think chains are very important in that because there were chains on us then, on our great, great, great grandparents, and there are chains on us now, Right, the criminal legal system puts many of those people's great, 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 great granddaughters and grandsons and other folks in chains that are just a little bit higher technology, right? The handcuffs just got fancier, right? Then the current iteration of that, the current version of that is very young. Um, and I, we've been in the protest supporting folks. I think I've been a uh, it's hard to say because they just kind of continue, but I think I've been to four or five in the past uh, seven, six or seven days here, just here in Boston and then in the suburbs of Boston. Um, this current iteration is very, very young. It's probably people who were too, were too young to be out in the streets, were a bit young to, to be out protesting when Black Lives Matter, uh, when Alicia Garza and, and other women started the, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, when uh, George Zimmerman was acquitted for, for murdering uh, Trayvon Martin, and when um, uh, Mike Brown was murdered in the streets of Ferguson uh, by, uh, by the police. Um, so that was, you know, about, about five, depending on what you're saying, five or six years ago. And a lot of these people were maybe 14, 13 years old then, because the folks we're seeing in the streets, at least from, from what I'm seeing, are 17, 18, 19 year olds. So it's not even gen, uh, it's not even millennial uh, young black and brown folks, it's gen Z. It's people who were born probably some after 9-11. So the world for them, I think is a very different place. And it's amazing. I was just out uh, seeing people protest last night and very, very young um, folks of color. And, and I was guessing by their, um, their elation that this was the first time they'd ever been at a protest. It's the first time they ever could say what they really felt about the way that their humanity is policed. And it was uh, a young woman who was with me, uh, like legal observing, trying to make sure uh, protesters' rights were protect protected, just looked at him and said, you know, these people are just giving me life. They're really giving me life. Um, so yeah, it's just from the question about, um, yeah, the uh, composition of the protests, so kind of, um, what kind of people, um, you know, 
for testing and also the um um yeah the you know the support in the public in general and uh, we were saying in spite of the the media narrative yeah i think it's quite interesting because a number of things are happening in terms of who is coming out to protest um, so in New York and in Boston and uh, other you know, major cities in the United States, we're seeing protests every day or multiple protests every day. Um, and they're led mostly by young, younger black folks, a lot of younger black women. Um, however, there's a whole bunch of you know, Asian folks, indigenous folks, um, certainly uh, uh, Latinx folks, um, folks from here in Boston, there's a lot of folks from the Caribbean, uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Um, and other folks, and many of them who are also who also identify as black, uh, are black. Um, and then uh, a lot of uh, white folks coming out. It's really interesting because I think some people are very aware of the ideas of systemic oppression. Other people here in the U.S. are in a very what I would call a, like a liberal mindset, and they say things like, "Oh, we came to help you," or yeah. or. I have an idea if we have a peaceful protest. And I actually saw the other day um, someone playing a ukulele. <laughs> and, and he was, and, and there were there were thousands of black people marching by him, and he was standing on the side of the protest, and he was giving the protesters like advice on, on how they should behave for their liberation. Like they're like they are in our great grandparents and great great grandparents. That person physically probably exists because of resistance movements that, I don't wanna say are in their DNA, but, but are in their familial history. And the, and, and the person, what the person was saying was actually just wrong. They go, oh, we need to be peaceful to show them that we are good and that's the way we get free and you have to vote. And that's not the way anyone has ever gotten free anywhere in the world. Be like, please, Mr. Oppressor, I would like to vote for you not to oppress me where I would like for the other person to oppress me slightly less. Um, and then I just cite the, I'll call it my ukulele incident. It was amazing because I was sort of watching him and I was like, oh, I really don't feel like explaining. It's not my job to explain to every person. Um, but I also felt that he was sort of in this very soft way accosting a bunch of young people, like saying you're, what you're doing is wrong, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to help you. But then I saw a young white woman come up on a bike and she said, excuse me, I want to explain something to you. You need to stop what you're doing. And I was standing with her brother and I was like, that's amazing. What is happening right there is amazing. <laughs> and, um, and you can see this moment of, in, in, in a way, a double maturity in, in that moment, right? So this young woman, very young woman is explaining to him what real resistance to white supremacy is. He is also being very a man and going, no, no, I, I'm just trying to do this thing. He's like waving his hands, gesticulating. And then, but she talked him down and said, no, what you need to understand is the black liberation struggle is a, is a liberation struggle that has taught people all over the world, right? People in South Africa, people in India, people in, in, in um, Israel, Palestine, people in, in Ireland looked to the black liberation struggle and said, oh, wait, you did that that way? That sounds great. We maybe we'll do it that way, or maybe we'll we'll add to it, right? And then it's come around the world and then come back, right? Because people here in the United States have looked at Palestine and said, "Oh, they're doing that there. Maybe we should do that here, right?" So for this person who has probably never really, I don't know, I don't know the person, but I just use it as an example, has really never struggled um, for liberation, you know, for collective liberation, to to have this explaining moment. But I think that's happening, you know, multiplied by thousands or millions in the United States where people are coming into their own and they're starting to learn how to be um, in a struggle for liberation. And I think the United States really hasn't seen a struggle with this breadth and this intensity for near, nearly half, uh, you know, half a, half a century. Um, so it's a beautiful thing. Um, it's an incredible thing. It's literally in every state in the United States and yeah. our colonies and it's happening on, in Native nations uh, inside of that are colonized by, by uh, the United States and, and then it's happening you know, outside the borders of the United States also. Um, yeah, actually leading on from that, you know, because you know, maybe what the ukulele guy was saying, actually quite, you know, there have been prominent figures saying similar things, especially this kind of discourse of, okay, 
uh, don't burn your own house down. And then, you know, you know, what we, you know, the, the end point of this is what we need to do, you know, eventually is vote, turn, you know, go out and vote. Um, but how does, how do you think that the, these relate, to the, the protests relate to electoral politics? Because actually, like, I think, you know, to, to an extent, I think maybe, like the media here perhaps is kind of portraying this also as like an anti-Trump movement. I mean, it's kind of easy to do that when you don't have a good idea, of, um, when you're not kind of, you know, you're not really familiar with the context. So um, um, yeah, I, I don't know if you have any, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm gonna quote Joe, Joe Biden here. <laughs> um, Joe Biden was interviewed recently and he was commenting on, on police brutality and like how police should engage people. And he said, prophetically, I don't really understand why, don't, why they don't just shoot them in the leg. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I mean, if we were gonna make it up, if we were gonna make up an analysis of the Republican Party in the United States of America, the current status of the Republican Party in the United States of America, and the current status of the Democratic Party in the United States of America, the Republican Party is, shoot those thugs, the Democratic Party is shoot those thugs in the leg. And we're going, if you shoot us, we will rebel. <laughs> That's not, we're for no shooting at all. We're for you not having any guns. We're for like no one being in that position to shoot us, right? And it's just outrageous because it is, it's not even a tacit exception, right? It's almost an explicit exception of the fact that the person is, I don't like this word because it has uh, uh, this history to it, but the, that the person is a thug or the person is a criminal. And they need to be, like what, what Joe Biden has said here is they, need, they actually do need to be put down, right? The person needs to be stopped, right? Where you, there are so many examples of a person getting a traffic ticket or shoplifting or being at a protest, right? And people come with, you know, chemical agents or people use you know so-called less than lethal weaponry or people use absolutely lethal weaponry do, do you think it's a, a yeah that was part of one of the questions that i wanted to ask do you think it's a kind of watershed moment because you know it's it's much bigger it seems than ferguson uh at the moment i don't know yeah what i absolutely i'm gonna answer in a backward way. I absolutely do not think it is a watershed moment. I know for a demonstrable fact, 100% that it is a watershed moment. Someone recently said, a younger person, I was on a call and someone said, oh, well, you know, we all thought it was going to happen, you know, five years ago. And I'm like, I didn't. I thought that that was going to be like taking a step up. We just got in the turbo lift elevator that goes to the penthouse. Like, this is changing. Like, they're not, this is, abs quantitatively far different than what happened before and that isn't decrying that it's building on that this is because of what happened before right it is because of a whole bunch of other social forces it is because black people are pissed the hell off and we're ready to be more free we've always black people in this country have always struggled for freedom and always won we can i play this game with someone i'm like pick a month that black people have existed in the united states pick a month give me one day and i will tell you massive victories for liberation that people struggled for in that month any month of any year of any decade ever since black people have been here sometimes they're really big ones right sometimes they're little but they all happen and this one is a really really big one a really big one i mean my city bank sent me an email and they were like we believe in racial equality and we think racism is bad. And I'm like, your city bank. I mean, like, if we're gonna pick people that are institutional players in racism, it's like police and city bank. Um, but uh, Bank of America so far has been silent. Um, I don't know, I actually bet you they haven't been silent. But those are, I mean, it's obviously just bullshit, trash propaganda. Yeah. But the fact that these that they have you know, to say it. demonic corporations met and be like, what do we need to say about the Negroes? And someone's like, they don't call them Negroes anymore, right? 
colored? What are they? Colored? And some like crusty like billionaire banker is like, well, I guess we have to say something or they're going to do something to our bank. Maybe, maybe we should write something on the internet. It isn't good that they did that, but it's a stunning marker that they believe yeah. they have. Right. Yeah. The same way all of these police are like, oh, how can we make people like us? In the United States, the police have all these like bullshit propaganda programs. So like the Boston police have a $75,000 ice cream truck. I'm gonna say that again slow for folks. <laughs> the Boston police have a $75,000 ice cream truck. I think they got like, the Wait, how, I, I, I can't get my head around. Why do they have an ice cream truck? What do they do with I'm it? Not, I'm not answering that question. I'm not gonna answer that question. <laughs> For, because, they're, because they're cops and they beat people in the street and they murder people in the street and people don't like them and they're confused as why people don't like oh, them. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, right. really, really <laughs> yeah. It's like, self-care. It's, it's not to stop killing people, it's yeah. to drive around and give like five-year-old kids ice cream pops and wait till they're 14 and then they can tackle them in the street and frisk yeah, them yeah. And, and, and beat them. Um, but they do this. So they drive around. It was just in the park by my neighborhood a while ago. And then they also do this thing, it's called, and people do this all around the country, it's called coffee with a cop. So they come to the neighborhood yeah, donut yeah. shop and they buy donuts for everyone. And then people come and they have coffee with a cop, which the last one of these I saw, it was basically just a bunch of cops driving up eating donuts, which I was like, wow, this is an amazing public relations. Because they really believe if they just come to like the YMCA a couple of times, people will like, I'm like, if you stop and frisk someone's like grandfather or their young cousin four times in a day or harass a bunch of kids who are in the park or chase a bunch of kids down or beat some kid up because he says something that you don't like or ultimately in ma every major city in the United States, murder someone, right? Murder someone. We don't care about your ice cream. We don't care about your ice cream and we don't care about your donuts. We care about our loved ones being murdered. We care about being free in this country, right? So Boston police, coffee with a cop is canceled. Your ice cream truck is canceled. When you come to the festivals, the Caribbean festivals and the carnivals, and they have like a cop doing a weenie roast in the neighborhood, that's canceled because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Some young black girl is going to walk up and she's going to say the words that she learned in the protest. She's going to say like, I'm not saying these words, but I'm going to say what I've heard in the streets and what I've seen spray painting. She's going to say, fuck 12. Or she's going to say, all cops are bastards. And it's going to be a six-year-old kid and the cop is going to be, what just happened? What just happened? Because they know, before, people were like, oh, I guess I'm supposed to like them. I guess I'm supposed to, like, keep, maybe I'll get in trouble if I don't. So they took the ice cream or they took the donut, right? Or they took the sauce. It's all food. I don't know why. It's because the police want the free food, too. That's not an option anymore. It's not, you can't even astroturf it, right? You can't even paint over it, right? It's people are like, no, nah, we know, you know, you're trying to spackle the whole in. We see that it's spackle. It ain't the real thing. You need to fix it. And fix it means you need to rip it down and replace it, right? Yeah. Because policing in every city, in every state, in every territory in this country that this country controls, right? From the US Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, to Guam, to Alaska, to you know, occupied Hawaii, to the native nations and all the states in the United States is not broken, is rigged, it's a system. It was built to control black, brown, poor, indigenous people. It was built to do that. It has always done that. If you think you can fix it, it's a machine. It's basically like, everyone kind of thinks like, oh, we can fix it. It's just like a car, it's broken. I'm like, no, it's a massive like grater that it just stuffs black bodies and brown bodies and it shreds them. It works perfectly to do that. It actually works very, very well to do that. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, sometimes the jail in Milwaukee, Wisconsin is 100% black people. If it was the Klan running the jail, if the Ku Klux Klan ran that jail, they'd be like, well, let's get some Jews and some Catholics. Like they wouldn't have that absolute number they literally they would not right and and if it was like if it was actually the american nazi party they'd be like well we should definitely get some homosexuals in here too like lock them up but there's the racialization of policing is just it it, it, it is at a peak that you couldn't imagine and it has always been that way in this country 
always. And it is really hard for people to understand that that is not normal. And that is not, it's the same way that, you know, 250 years ago, many people who said, well, I'm for abolition of slavery, of, in, of enslaving people, I'm, a, I'm for abolition of slavery, but what will we do? Where will the people go? I think they'll all starve to death or something. And people couldn't imagine what life would be like without enslaved black people. And the people who really thought it should end, they said, that's a bad thing, it should end. They couldn't have the vision and the imagination. And today, the same people, the same people that we, we were abolitionists then, our forebears were abolitionists then. They were abolitionists during the, the freedom struggles in the 60s and 70s. And they're ab we are abolitionists now. So all we are doing is following in what our great, great, great grandparents, what, you know, um, uh, Harriet Tubman, Fannie Lou Hamer, and, you know, Alicia Garza are sisters in the struggle, right? And our, our direct, direct, I would say a direct lineage. I don't want to put stuff on, on other folks, but our direct lineage. And they're saying, like, we want to stop this whole thing. We want to stop this whole thing. And we want to imagine a world that p people can be free in. And with the things that they do, and that they've always done, we can never be free. And everyone, their mind like clicks pause then and go, I can't imagine what that would be. So I don't, I can't allow it to happen. And we're like, no, we're gonna be free. And if it's disruptive to the way you think about the world, then you need to get out of the way or you need to change your mindset. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll just do a thing for that and you can cut it and make the last thing sound the best thing. But I think really, um, black folks in the United States are, I don't know if you know this analogy, the canary in the coal mine. Do you know that analogy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah I don't know, I, I don't know if, how often, if it's just in the United States, that's the same. Yeah. States, but, well, it might actually just be just a British saying. It's a mining saying, whatever. <laughs> no, but, yeah, exactly. I imagine so. Yeah. But black folks are the canary in the coal mine. It's like, and we are not, we are not fighting just for black liberation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we know that, that the, 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 the marker that is black liberation in the United States is the bellwether. It is the canary in the coal mine. It is the, the indicia of liberation. Because if we can stop the capitalist American empire from oppressing black people, then all motherfuckers is gonna be free. Then there are gonna be so much, there's gonna be so much more freedom in the world. And that's fact, right? And we know that from a tactical perspective that you know, LGBTQ and two-spirit folks, that poor folks, that disabled folks, um, that linguistic minorities, that, that immigrants in this country, that we all see that, it, it, all of us together, that our liberation is bound. And there are people who are like six of those things or three of them or two. Um, and that intersectionality is part of our strength. And also it's, as I said, it's the bellwether. Like when black women are free in this country, if, we're, we're, more, we're done. Like, well, that's, that's, everybody else is going to be free.